to put your questions directly to the Shadow Health Secretary, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, just a quick plug, if you enjoy this event, um, check out our tickets for our online conference, which will be in March. I'll drop the details in the chat. We'll be joined by lots of speakers, we'll be hosting workshops and that sort of thing. Um, and we're obviously talking about COVID tonight. And I think that starts with the really sad news today that the UK has now surpassed 100,000 deaths from this virus. And um, that's more deaths in a year than civilian deaths in five years of the Blitz. Just to put that in perspective, particularly when people talk about Blitz spirit in this pandemic. Um, we've obviously had over the last year, some in the media and conservative backbenchers who have resisted the necessary measures to help suppress this virus and the support needed to reduce the social and financial effects of that. And we have a prime minister whose pandemic response has been defined by indecision and cronyism. But we also have hope. We don't just have one vaccine, we have multiple. And throughout the last year or so, we've had the Labour Party and the trade union movement standing up for families and households um, throughout this really difficult time. Um, and we're, of course, joined by John, who has been part of that response. Um, so it's really nice to speak to John tonight. And uh, hosting will be Omar Salem, who's an Open Labour Committee member and has helped organise this event. So I'll hand over to Omar now. Thanks very much. Um, uh, um, thanks very much to Jonathan for uh, joining us today. It's really great that he's able to engage on this issue with uh, Open Labour members. It's obviously um, a huge issue at the moment, and I think it shows the importance of working together, collective action, action solidarity. We've seen how you know the NHS has worked to deal with things. We've seen how well the vaccine programme has gone when using the NHS um, and um, I think we want to make sure that in the future, you know, we 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 start these crises in a more resilient position. Um, and I, and Labour is obviously doing a lot, and Jonathan and the rest of the front bench, well, whole Labour team in Parliament, doing a lot to um, speak up for that. And so it's great to you know have Jonathan here to be able to uh, talk about uh, these issues. Um, so the format is going to be that uh, I'm going to. Um, uh, well, Jonathan's going to give us a brief overview um, of his perspective on COVID and, and what he's been doing. And then I'm going to ask him a few questions um, based um, on qu questions that have been emailed in uh, prior to the event. And thanks, everyone, for uh, sending those in. Um, and then um, you'll be able to put questions into the chat as well. Um, so please do um, start putting them in um, as soon as you want to. Um, and um, I'll read some of those out uh, for Jonathan to uh, answer. So um, on that note, um, over to Jonathan. Well, thank you very much, Omar. Thank you, Tess. And thank you to Open Labour for inviting me along this evening to offer a few reflections and hopefully answer your questions. And we have, uh, I think we had to arrange, rearrange this from before um, Christmas. So I'm sorry for that, but I was keen to come along to open labour because I think in the last sort of how, however old you are now is it two three four years is it five years it's certainly in recent years anyway you've provided that forum for uh, uh, debate discussion of big ideas uh, a focus on ideas but discussion in a in a comradely way and I think if we're honest amongst ourselves and that this isn't a this isn't a time to be going into the ins and outs of it all, but I think discussion across the movement hasn't been as comradely as it should have been uh, in, in, in recent, recent years. So I'm grateful for Open Labour for uh, trying to build those bridges and provide that space. Uh, as I say, this was supposed to be before Christmas and we've rearranged it for today and we do meet on an absolutely horrific day, uh, a, a day of unimaginable uh, grief. For us to have surpassed the 100,000 mark, I think is a, a tragedy uh, beyond anything that any of us could have appreciated what could happen. I mean, Patrick Vallance, the chief scientific advisor early on in this crisis, was talking about 20,000 deaths as uh, a reasonable expectation. Today's news is just absolutely horrendous. 
And the reason it is so horrendous, so horrific, and makes me so angry, to be frank, is it wasn't inevitable. It didn't have to be like this. I think we all accept that when a, uh, a new disease jumps from species to human and spreads across the world with speed and severity unlike anything we've seen since influenza in 1918, I think we all would accept that sadly that would lead to people losing their lives and people becoming severely ill. I think we understand that. But it didn't have to be on the scale it has been. And I've just been reflecting upon the last 12 months on the numbers of mistakes the government have made, uh, the number of misjudgments they have made. But I think it also exposes a more fundamental issue that we went into this crisis less resilient. We went into this crisis, to be frank, sicker as a country, uh, iller as a country because of 10 years of austerity. So what I mean by that is, and, and the obvious impact of austerity in terms of public services, our NHS went into this crisis, short of 100,000 staff, short of 40,000 nurses, short of thousands of doctors. It went into the crisis on the back of 15,000 bed cuts, and it went, went into the crisis um, exhausted, overstretched, pushed the limit uh, year after year, as of course you so memorably uh, uh, demonstrated, Omar, when you put Johnson on the spot when he visited um, uh, the, the hospital where you were with your with your with your partner and child, and I hope I hope your family are doing are doing well now. And please send please send them my my best wishes and regards. So our NHS was run down going into this crisis. Our public health sector had suffered from years of multi million pound cuts, which meant they were not at the capacity they should have been going to this crisis, and that in turn meant that uh, um, uh, though that, that a lot of the testing laboratory capacity in the country was not where it should be. Our social care sector had suffered multi-billion pound cuts going into this crisis and, and has been run on a austerity model where, where, where zero hours contracts, low pay, temporary work as what uh, has been the business model which uh, uh, many of the big uh, uh, equity companies who now have bought the big social care companies, how, that's how they've been running that sector. But, but there's an even more fundamental thing, issue, is that austerity isn't just about the level of funding that you put into public services. Uh, it's about more fundamentally about how you run your economy and the decisions that you make about your economy. And we've been running the economy in such a way for 10 years that inequality, poverty, deprivation uh, 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 was getting worse. And we know there is a direct link between poverty and deprivation and your life chances. To be frank, if you're born into poverty, you have 19 fewer years healthy living than somebody who is well off. Uh, 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 people in poverty and deprivation uh, have seen their life expectancy not only stall, but begun to begin to go backwards in some of the poorest parts of society. And why this is insignificant in terms of COVID is because I think COVID is, for me, is the interaction of two pandemics. Because you've got the, co the, the, the SARS-CoV virus itself, which causes COVID disease, which is, uh, it, it is in many cases a respiratory disease, but not always, which exploits and feeds off this huge burden of chronic disease that we have built up in society over many years. Diabetes, heart disease, uh, uh, stroke, mental health issues. And all of those chronic diseases cluster disproportionately in the poorest areas. Because if you're poorer and in a more deprived background, you're more likely to have heart disease. You're more likely to suffer from certain cancers. You're more likely to suffer stroke. You're more likely to be on uh, prescription antidepressants or indeed have a, a, a other uh, uh, mental health uh, conditions. And all of these issues make you more vulnerable to COVID. And then on top of that, when you look at the, the measures that have been implemented, the necessary measures that have been implemented to break chains of um, transmission, uh, measures which Boris Johnson in, in, implemented too late, you know, always late to every single lockdown, but all the lockdown measures and other measures, again, impact most severely on the poorest 
in society. Because we're in a lockdown now, all of us here are very lucky. We've got access to a laptop or a computer or a smartphone or a tablet, and we're all on a Zoom call. There are lots of people who don't have the advantage like I have of being able to work from home on my laptop. There's lots of people in this lockdown, probably about 10 million people, who still have to go to work, probably on public transport, uh, uh, probably in workplaces where there's no COVID security. We saw that just this weekend with the DVLA offices in Swansea, where there's been a mass outbreak. There's a lot of people who, uh, 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 even if their workplaces are COVID secure, if they get sick um, because they're on a zero hours contract or low pay or temporary work, uh, do not get access to decent sick pay, so cannot isolate themselves. So we've got a system where you're asking people to go hungry in order to break uh, 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 transmission. So it's a sort of double whammy, this. It's been the poorest because the most deprived were most likely to suffer long-term conditions, which make them more vulnerable to COVID in the first place, who also are the very people who are more exposed to COVID because of the nature of their living circumstances. So that is why our response to COVID or, 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 or COVID is a different ways you can put it, but it is, a, it is an issue of fairness. It is an issue of socialism, of social democracy, of progressive values, whatever label you want to use to describe your beliefs and outlooks. I don't want to get hung, on, hung up on the labels, but it is a issue for the left, the left and the centre left because, because it is the poorest and the most deprived uh, who suffer the most. So that's, that was where we were going into this. And of course, in the crisis, in the crisis, we've seen mistake after mistake, not just the lockdown too late going into every single lockdown and ignoring the scientific advice, the failure to invest pro pro properly in decent contact tracing services give, uh, and giving contract tracing services to public, local public health uh, 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 authorities and a refusal to implement sort of very detailed cluster busting retrospective tracing that we see in uh, countries like Japan and Taiwan. A failure to pay people decent sick pay uh, 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 so they can isolate themselves. A failure early on in the crisis uh, to provide our nurses and care staff with adequate PPE, which in itself was because of austerity, because we dwindled down the uh, PPE stockpiles because of years uh, uh, of, of, of cutbacks. A failure to secure our borders which is ironic given that politicians like Priti Patel, um, whole purpose for existence, I thought, was to take back control of our borders. And that was why they banged on about Brexit and all the rest of it. So at the very moment when we needed them to control our borders, they were missing uh, uh, in action. Uh, and, and now there are worries, of course, that while vaccination is going uh, uh, well, we need to ensure that vaccination is rolled out quickly and rapidly because as soon as you can roll out vaccination, uh, if you can roll it out to about 30 million people, you can reduce deaths and hospitalizations by 99%. So the fundamental point I wanna say is that it didn't have to be like this. It didn't have to be like this. And it's a huge tragedy that it is. And the question now is, what can we do to get the government to change course? Because our whole aim must be uh, about suppressing this virus, crunching it right down, and saving as many lives as possible until vaccination allows us to move out of the uh, out of the situation we are currently in. Thanks, Jonathan, for that overview, which I think um, we'd all agree with. Um, can I just ask you a question about the approach that Labour is taking to opposition because on COVID, because that's kind of changed a bit, you know, over the over the last um, uh, nine months or however long it's been, a year almost. Um, uh, in terms of that approach and, you know, why was that and, and what approach are we taking now to, 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 to opposition on this? Well, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if it has changed. I mean, look, uh, my approach, I mean, I've been the, 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 the Shadow Health Secretary from the start of this, and I was just looking back at my, um, uh, some of my papers and I just noticed that my first briefing meeting with the chief medical officer was a, a year ago last week because uh, you know Chris Whitty quite rightly and appropriately would brief, briefs us on um, you know on, on confidential terms and, and that's entirely appropriate for you know them to do that for the official opposition in a crisis like this and and and, and, and throughout um, we've always taken the view that we should probe 
ask questions, uh, uh, ask about failures, but be followed by the science. But to do that, not with the aim of scoring some political points or developing some political dividing line to be used on a leaflet, but if we can probe the government and press the government on a particular particular course of action uh, and get the government to change change its uh, approach, then hopefully that improves the national response to COVID. And uh, I, I, I don't personally think that I have changed in my tact in that respect over the previous 12 months. And um, it's, it's, it's always a balance, this stuff. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, should I be shouting and screaming and, um, you know, um, you know, thumping the dispatch box? I don't know. I'll leave others to judge whether that is appropriate or not. But I think it's important to be asking the probing questions, to be pushing where they're getting things wrong. And there are issues where uh, uh, they have changed in response, but there's also issues where they've monumentally failed. Yeah, I've been talking about sick pay and helping people to quarantine themselves literally from day one. Now, the one concession they gave us early on was that they allowed people to claim statutory sick pay from day one rather than day three. I mean, that's a pretty meagre concession, but uh, you know, they hadn't even, that hadn't even, occur even occurred to them at that point. So at least they did that, but it's not, it's not nearly enough. It's not nearly enough. People need to be given sick pay and financial support so they can isolate themselves. And we'll keep on calling, that, calling for that. I've been calling for um, um, uh, to make sure workplaces are COVID secure. I'll carry on calling for that. I mean, we, we called for them to go into lockdown before they went into lockdown. In the first lockdown, uh, actually, um, uh, we did actually call for it. Uh, but at the time, there, I've got to tell you, there were people on the in the Labour sort of leadership um, who were reluctant for us to call for a lockdown. And, uh, you know, I won't go into the personalities I and mean, maybe I'll put it in my memoirs. Um, um, but there were people who didn't want us to call for it for, for legitimate reasons, because of concerns around civil liberties and things of that nature. Um, uh, although I would say some of the people who were reluctant to call for a lockdown would the way they talk now, you'd think they were calling for it from day one. But anyway, that's a different issue, I suppose. Uh, and of course, we called for the, the November lockdown uh, the, before the government did. And we called for a lockdown before this one because we've always followed the science. And I think that will always be our approach. But, you know, we will we, we will we do criticise them and push them to go further um, because that's the job of an opposition. Uh, and what would you say, just to push you a bit further on that, because quite a few people have emailed in this question or questions along this line that to those members party members who feel that Labour should be tougher on the government and uh pushing them more and more willing to you know vote against things or um in other ways um uh be be kind of uh tougher in their approach is you know what would you say to those members because you know it obviously is a huge crisis and and and, and I guess people feel that 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 that's that's the best strategy to to maybe make a difference. Um, at least that I think there are substantial number of members who feel like that. Well, I mean, voting against the government would presumably mean voting down the lockdown provisions. And I don't think we should vote or attempt to vote down lockdown provisions. And remember, look, the extraordinary thing about Boris Johnson is he, he's an immensely weak personality. Uh, despite all his bravado and his kind of, you know, sort of Billy Bunter-esque uh, vocabulary, he's actually, underneath it, he's a very weak, insecure person. And he's completely terrified of the right-wing Tory MPs. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, he's got an 80-seat majority, right? I mean, you know, whatever, whatever we want to think should or shouldn't have happened, in the 2019 election, he got, whether we like it or not, he got an 80 seat majority. He should be riding high. He should be dominating his party. And yet he allows his right wing Tory MPs to drag him along on everything. I've never seen such a weak prime minister uh, in that respect. I mean, I would understand it if he was worried about losing his majority. So, so uh, uh, he's always terrified. Uh, uh, when he brings these votes, that all these Tory MPs are going to vote against him. Um, so I think, and I don't think voting down lockdowns would be in the national interest. 
I mean, I don't like a lockdown. Someone's put in, in, in the chat about what about the mental health implications? I mean, lockdowns have intense implications for mental health and uh, 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 well-being. And, uh, you know, because the thing that COVID thrives on is social interaction because it's airborne. It, you catch it through, through people breathing and talking and, and then particles left in the air. So social interaction is what it thrives on. So it's particularly cruel that the, unless, until vaccination is effectively rolled out, one of the most effective interventions is for us to isolate ourselves from our friends and loved ones, which can lead to awful uh, uh, mental health problems. I mean, John Steinbeck wrote, a sad soul can kill you faster than any germ. I mean, probably not biologically entirely correct, but we see the point he was making. And we know that in lockdowns, uh, and when people, you know, uh, uh, prescriptions for antidepressants are at some of their highest levels ever post lockdown. There's data to suggest that people are drinking more in lockdowns. I wrote, um, some of the colleagues on the call may have seen that over the years I've spoken about my own uh, uh, personal um, uh, sort of struggles or issues with my father who was had a drink problem and how alcoholism and his alcoholism coloured all my childhood. Uh, there will be children locked in houses with parents abusing drink, um, abusing drugs, sadly. Uh, those children will not be coming to the attention of social services and schools in the, in the same way that they would have would they, they be going into schools. So we're building up a big wave of mental health and well-being problems as a result of these lockdowns. So we don't like lockdowns. I don't like lockdowns. I don't want us to be in lockdowns. But but with the virus at the prevalence that it has been at, uh, because of the mistakes that have been made by this government, lockdowns have become uh, necessary. Uh, uh, and if we voted them down, there's always a risk that all the right-wing Tory MPs um, could have could have joined us in voting them down. And I just I don't think that would have been in the national interest. Um, on the mental health side, I guess one of the effects of the lockdown possibly is a more awareness of mental health as an issue, more understanding of how it does actually affect everyone. Um, and um, do, you, do you think that, that it could be, an op uh, do you think that, that uh, you know, following the, um, this, that there'd be scope for, you know, building that support for a, you know, a proper mental health service and a stronger mental health service in the NHS rather than it being the kind of under-supported service that it currently is. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think they are, there are four big policy um, uh, or, or four big um, crises coming out of this period. First is mental health. The obvious impacts of lockdowns, people being isolated, bereavement, grief for those who have lost someone in this uh, in the pandemic. And I think we're going to see a huge impact on uh, and a huge demand on mental health services uh, from whether from the anxiety and worries that people have all the way up to the more serious, serious conditions. And I think we really need to uh, uh, prioritize mental health services in the way we haven't before. I mean, I mean, the WHO in 72 years ago talked about health as an absence of physical de disease and, and, and well-being. And I think putting well-being at the heart of our policy agenda is so important. So you have to make sure that children get access to mental health support. You have to make sure that staff on the front line facing burnout, like our NHS staff are, need access to mental health support. And Rosanna Alan Khan in the Shadow Cabinet is doing a lot of work on the on mental health support for NHS staff. You need, we need to ensure that... Um, uh, uh, that we have decent mental health services. The second thing which kind of links to that is children's health. Because I think children are, uh, are going to be real forgotten victims of this crisis if we're not careful. They're not directly impacted in COVID in, in as much as they are less susceptible to the disease. Uh, um, and, and, and are broadly, um, uh, uh, we're less worried about children in that respect. But the indirect consequences of the pandemic and lockdowns are, have a huge have huge consequences for children. The obvious one is, you know, being out of learning for so long and the mental health implications, but also childhood obesity. We went into this crisis with one of the highest childhood obesity rates in Western Europe, 
I can only imagine our childhood obesity rates are getting worse and worse with children not in school. Uh, the data isn't quite published in the way it would normally, but anecdotal evidence that younger children have missed out on immunizations and vaccinations because staff have been redirected to other areas. And of course, the broader concerns around children uh, falling through the cracks, um, not being observed by schools, etc., and whether they're at risk of domestic abuse and other awful abuses that sadly go on in the home. So I think there's a children's health crisis coming out of this. And the third crisis I think coming out of this is cancer. Lots of, there are lots of operations and treatments that have been delayed and postponed as a result of the NHS being in such dire straits. But I think the cancer time bomb uh, is a time bomb. Huge numbers of people have missed scans, have missed checkups. Huge numbers of people have had treatments delayed, rounds of chemotherapy delayed, and so on. I really think we're facing a big cancer crisis coming out of this as well. So uh, mental health, children's health, and cancer, I, I think are gonna have to be three big priorities for, for in the coming years for how we reset our NHS and ensure that our National Health Service responds to these. Of course, there's other issues as well, you know, but I think, they're, I think they're gonna be three of the big ones that we're really have to, gonna have to focus on. Thanks. Um, so I'm now going to try to wrap two questions into one. So this is about, um, but I think they're, they're uh, kind of associated. Um, so obviously the, the vaccine program seems to be going fairly well. And I think that's mainly down to the fact that we're using the NHS for that. And, and they've got the, pro the systems and, and everything to, to do it. And they're all working very hard on that. Um, but I guess one of the controversial issues is uh, this decision um, to delay the second vaccine. Um, and I, I guess that is also associated with a kind of a separate issue, a separate but kind of interlinking issue, which is an anti-vaxxers and kind of that kind of side of things. Because um, I guess the tricky thing here is, you know, what is legitimate debate and what isn't? Um, how do you get the messaging on these things uh, right without having effects that maybe you you know you wouldn't want in terms of you know perhaps, perhaps fanning the flames of anti-vaxxers so um what's your view on the you know the second dose and then on the messaging around both the second dose and also the anti-vaxxers yeah i mean these are good questions and I, and I can see that uh is it natalie in the chat box has been raising this particular um issue as well i think on the dosing schedule there's a lot there's a lot of debate going on on this and you know at the end of the day the, the chief medical officers of the four nations of the united kingdom have endorsed this approach as has the british society of immunology as has indy sage uh, now at the weekend the bma and the doctors association raised concerns but then yesterday some of the royal colleges like the Royal College of Surgeons came out and endorsed this approach. So there's clearly a debate within the, the medical scientific community on this. Uh, and I think in the end, this is one where I think it's important that for me as a shadow health spokesperson, I'm asking the questions and I'm probing, but in the end of the day, if our chief medical officers and other figures in the medical science community are saying on balance they think it is the correct thing to do i'm that i'm prepared to go along with that but i will still keep asking the questions as, particularly as new data emerges it is a tricky one because you know you have got as i say you've got some royal colleges in a different position to the bma and the doctors association and you know and they're sort of arguing all arguing it out uh, what is what is what is worrying, of course, is that for NHS staff on the front line who just want reassurance, um, this can be quite bewildering. And it's, it's natural that people would want reassurance because our staff on the front line were so desperately let down early on in this crisis. We didn't protect them with PPE early on. That was a massive failure. And my, my worry also is that given that we know we have this new variant, which is more infectious, this variant, this mutation that came from Kent and is now spread across the world. I think, I think it's been identified in 55 countries now, I think, or probably more than that. 
Uh, we know it's more infectious, 50 to 70% more infectious. And we know that there is now a question as to whether it could well be more deadly as well. I think staff on the front line need more, better PPE. So I've been calling for an upgrade in the PPE that frontline NHS staff has. And the point about the variant is that now we know that this virus mutates. I mean, sorry, we've always known that viruses mutate. Let me correct myself. Now we've seen some mutations in this virus which make it more infectious. It is a reminder that the quicker we vaccinate, uh, the better we're a better place we will be. We're in, we're in a race against evolution. Eh? So we've got to go further and faster on vaccination to protect people because the more virus circulates, this coronavirus is opportunistic. The more that, that it's circulating, there are more opportunities for it to mutate, which also is why we cannot just go down the road of a let's vaccinate Britain and beggar thy neighbour, you know, sod you to the rest of the world. It is not only is it morally repugnant, it's also completely counterproductive. Because if there's huge reservoirs of the virus circulating across the world, there are opportunities for further mutations, which can just bounce back and hit us. So we need a campaign to roll out vaccination quickly across the United Kingdom, but we have to play our part on a global stage as well to ensure that we vaccinate across the world the World Health Organization has been pointing out some of the appalling statistics of vaccination rates in some of the countries um, across the world. In terms of anti-vax, we've got to take it on. And I see this in Leicester. I'm an MP in Leicester. I live here in Leicester. This is where I'm, I'm beaming to you from my little back office in, in, uh, in my little back office in Leicester, where everybody, if, whenever I do a TV interview in here, uh, everybody on Twitter um, takes the mickey out of my wallpaper. But anyway, um, uh, uh, here in Leicester, which has, I'm sure uh, friends on the call will know is a hugely diverse city, uh, I'm seeing all kinds of anti-vax nonsense being spread on WhatsApp, on Facebook. It's really dangerous stuff. Uh, so we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to have a big campaign for vaccine acceptability. So, for example, in a city like Leicester, we should be using our community pharmacists. I mean, if you walk into a community pharmacist here in Leicester... Uh, we can speak Gujarati, Punjabi, Urdu. I mean, all the languages that are, are, are well used here in, in, in Leicester. Uh, we should be bringing faith groups and community group leaders together. And we should get the data on rollout amongst the different groups here in cities like Leicester. And our faith groups and our community groups should be part of planning how we roll out the vaccination to different groups. In Birmingham, they've just put a vaccination centre in a mosque. I mean, you know, we should be doing using that as an example for all cities like mine in Leicester and, you know, those parts of London and Coventry and Bradford and so on. This is what we need to do more of this in order to take on some of this vaccine hesitancy that sadly we're seeing. Uh, one of the other questions that have come in is that is about migrant workers. Um, obviously, a lot of the workers in the NHS and in care homes are migrant are migrant workers. Um, and, um, uh, you know, at the same time of doing that, that work, um, the immigration status um, is potentially difficult uh, at the moment. What's um, your kind of approach to that? Well, I mean, I mean we have a, one of the real uh, uh, issues for a city like Leicester, and it would be the same in other uh, cities, I'm sure, is that you are asking people uh, uh, to isolate themselves if they are ill, or you're asking people to uh, interact with testing and tracing regimes, or, or you are now in asking people to interact with a vaccination regime. Uh, uh, um, uh, and people are reluctant to do it if they have no recourse to public funds. And they have, are reluctant to do it if they think that the system alerts them to uh, um, uh, authorities and they'll have questions around their immigration status and, uh, uh, and, and, and things like that. And there is paranoia and scepticism. Uh, but unless we, uh, look, you know, uh, the, the, the Tory party have introduced all these kind of, you know, health surcharges and all this sort of stuff, it's counterproductive. We, need, we should always be pursuing a public health approach. That means we have to roll out vaccination and we have to roll out and we have to ensure that workers are properly supported 
uh, when they are still isolate. And I think if you can put, if you can have a proper test and trace regime in place with proper isolation support, and you're ensuring that you're vaccinating all your key workers, uh, then I think you can deal with those sorts of issues that you are raising. But you won't deal with those issues that you are raising uh, if people are, uh, if people think it's a sort of trick. Or they think it's a, or they think the system is trying to sort of uh, uh, catch them out because of other reasons. You know, you know, if you want to deliver health security in the face of this pandemic, you've got to take public health action to protect all people and vaccinate all people. Thanks. And there's a question here from Joseph Ham um, asking um, uh, that the focus is on you know the COVID crisis at the moment. But how do we ensure uh, the country and the world is better prepared for future pandemics, especially considering this could take a variety of forms and the suggestions are loss of, bi of biodiversity increasing is increasing the prevalence of new zoonotic. I, don't, I, I have to admit, I don't know what zoonotic means, but um, maybe you do <laughs> diseases. Well, I think this is an absolutely brilliant question. And uh, 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 I don't know where. Uh, uh, Joseph Ham is on the screen, but uh, uh, well done for, uh, uh, I can't see him on my screen, um, but well done for asking it, um, because I think this is an absolutely superb question. And the reason I say that is because we've got to wake up to a big reality here. We, we think about this as a once in a lifetime event, more perhaps a once in a century event. It isn't. Sorry to be gloomy, colleagues, but look at what's happened in the last 10 years. We've had swine flu, the first SARS, MERS, Ebola in Africa, Zika in parts of the world. The tr sad truth, I can say, ah, hello, Joseph Ham, you've put, your, you've put your video on. It's a great question, Joseph, because climate change is creating the conditions in which, in which we are more vulnerable to other pandemics emerging. And the zoonotic point is when a pathogen jumps from animals to humans. That's what zoonotic is, right? And if you are, li if you are now in a world where you've got rapid urbanization in parts of the world, rapid deforestation in parts of the world, where you are disturbing and uh, uh, um, uh, traditional habitats and breaking them down, you're creating, the, you're creating more opportunities for pathogens to jump from animals to humans. If you've got global warming, you've got permafrost melting, which means pathogens which have literally, if you like, been frozen away for hundreds, if not thousands of years, are no longer frozen. And again, you're creating the opportunities for pathogens to jump from jump to humans. Uh, and if, you're, if the world is warming up, mosquitoes can fly, for, fly further. Uh, have a greater range. So all of a sudden you've got populations and countries who could be exposed to malarias and so on who were not previously exposed uh, 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 to, to malaria. So I actually think this is a key, key question. And the point is, unless we have a big agenda to tackle climate change and global warming and deforestation and the destruction of habitats and the frosting of permafrost and the whole range of issues, that is associated with these changes that are happening, we will not we will not deliver the health security uh, that we need uh, as a, for our country and for, for all countries. And I and I think this has to be a big big part of the agenda this year because we've got obviously we've got COP26. The UK is hosting the G7. I think they've got to make the links between climate change and future pandemic risk because we will see more of these if we unless we tackle it. And the sad thing is, and the terrifying thing is, is that coronavirus, we were kind of almost, <laughs> let me put it like this, there's lots of nastier things that could have jumped and it could have been a nastier, nastier pandemic, extraordinarily as that may seem on the day when we've had 100,000 deaths. There are lots of nastier pathogens that could have jumped uh, and could have spread. So I think, I think, I think Joseph has, uh, uh, asked a really really good question and I'm actually and I'm actually doing some work on this with the scientists for labor group who as well um uh, and, and this is a big theme I'm going to want to be talking about more uh, 
But I think this is, you know, when we talk about a green agenda and Green New Deal and all those different campaigns and the important campaigns, I think we've got to get into pandemic risk as a result of climate change and how we build health security for the future as well. Um, so another question has come in from Daniel Davenport. He says, I'm a retail supervisor and I want to know when me and my staff will be receiving the vaccine, if at all, as we are now the worst place to catch it. We're yeah. the worst place to catch it. Good question, because we know that essentially, you know, this, uh, coming back to my remark I made in my opening comments, uh, you know, this is a phony lockdown for lots of people. Lots of people still have to go to work. People who work in shops, people who work in supermarkets, people who work in retail still have to go to work. People who work in Amazon uh, uh, packing factories and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and these people are more exposed to other people. There's greater social mixing, so they are more at risk. So I think what we need to start thinking about now is that once we get through the initial cohort on the vaccination schedule for those who are most vulnerable by age and it's understandable why they've done it by age to begin with because you know for every 20 years that you the every 20 years your risk to uh, covid uh, increases 10 times yeah so you know from sort of 60 70 80 you're really at risk of of death or severe disease from covid so i understand the schedule the vote that the, 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 the vaccination schedule to really focus on those who are more, most at risk from dying and if you can move your way through those top groups, you really do reduce deaths and hospitalizations significantly. Uh, and, uh, but then you've, got to, then you've got to think about the group of people who, who are uh, most at risk because of uh, their occupation and people who work in retail are very at risk. And then uh, traditionally taxi drivers, transport workers were, security guards, particular risk, uh, other public servants as well who are um, uh, uh, more, uh, 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 you know, who more, more interact with um, uh, people. I mean, care care home workers uh, have got the highest death rates. Uh, and I think I saw um, uh, some comments in the chat box about the uh, the atrocious response that we've had on uh, social care from the government. So yeah, I, I I think these key workers need to be need to be vaccinated after we've gone through the top priority groups uh, uh, by age. Interesting at the moment. Uh, the fastest growing group in intensive care and on ventilation is the 45 to 69 age cohort. And I, a lot of, I suspect a significant chunk of them will be people working in these ty ty types of jobs that I'm talking about, uh, where they're more exposed to risk and uh, uh, um, more social mixing. So these pe people do need protection. Um. Quite a specific question, but one that I think um, is really important to the people affected, which is, um, you know, what's what's Labour's view on um, uh, pregnant women being able to have their partners uh, with them kind of before and after and during labour? Um, because that's been kind of stopped and started and it seems to be quite patchy, the approach being taken in different different you know places. I mean, it has been patchy, and it's supposed to happen now, and it's supposed there's supposed to be procedures in place for it to, to for, for it to happen safely, and that has to be enforced. I mean, I think there is, I mean, her, I mean, I mean, childbirth is uh, sadly can still be extremely dangerous uh, for a lot of women, and I think some heartbreaking stories early on in the crisis of women on their own in that in that particular situation. I cannot. I mean, I'm a father. I've got two uh, two daughters. I just cannot imagine how, you know, to think, you know, what would happen should something go wrong in that in that moment, um, and for and for a woman to be on their own. So I think it it, it where where it, I, I think the NHS need to get better at ensuring that this happens because it is supposed to happen now uh, that partners are allowed and they should and that they should make sure that trusts are following the guidelines on it. Thank you. Um, another question more generally on, um, I, I guess, on um, the, the, the kind of approach to the lockdown in the sense of, you know, how, how do you think the government's gone too far in some places or has struck the wrong note in emphasising 
in its communication strategy or a communications approach to the lockdown measure. So obviously there was the kind of that instant of those um, uh, two women who went for a walk, you know, uh, with a with a with a, a cup of coffee. But it, there does seem to be quite a lot of evidence that being indoors is much much more dangerous than being outdoors. And you know we've had um, and and there seems to be it just seems to be a bit possibly a bit over the top the way the restrictions have been put on, you know, outdoors activities. And could there be scope, you know, for that to be relaxed, which might make it easier for people to comply with the, the indoor requirements, um, you know, because it just seems that like, it, it, you know, it, it, it just seems a, a bit misplaced at the moment, possibly. Yeah, I mean, I think, and this sort of leads to, I mean, David in the chat box has said Amazon warehouses actually have a really good system because they've got, um, uh, cameras and so on that bleep. So actually, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that point. But uh, but there is a wider point. So uh, you know, I should apologise to Amazon for using for accusing them of something they're not doing. But the the kind of point I'm trying to make is, is that is that you know there was all this focus on you know people having cups of coffee in the in the um, uh, walking in the Derbyshire countryside, or even whether Boris Johnson should have gone bicycling up to the London Olympic Stadium or whatever it was he did. I mean, the truth is. That transmission can take place outdoors. It can, but but it indoors is where is where the vast 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 majority of it takes place. And even though our infection rates are beginning to come down, we've still got twenty odd thousand people being infected. So they're getting infected somewhere. And when you look at the data, they're usually getting infected in a lot of them are getting infected in workplaces. Now a lot of it's in care homes. So tragically again. Uh, and some of it is infection in hospitals, but other place, but others it is workplace infections that are going on. And this is what we've got to be focusing on. We've got to make sure that workplaces are made secure. The health and safety executive should be doing proper inspections uh, of workplaces. We should look at ventilation standards in workplaces uh, 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 so that the air is of a certain quality. I mean, the CUC have called for this. We should look at di enforcing distancing in workplaces. Perhaps we should look at some of the FFP, FFP, FFP2 face masks uh, in workplaces as well. We've got to make sure that we make workplaces secure because not everybody is lucky enough to work from home on a laptop and join and be sat on Zoom calls all day. Millions of people still have to go to work. And unless we make the conditions in which they go to work safe, we will not break chains of transmission. Right? And 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 and, what, and and the fundamental point which I have to come back to again is that so long as there is the virus is highly president, prevalent, there are opportunities for it to mutate again, and in, and evade the vaccine response. So it's so so this lockdown has got to do two things. It's got to rapidly scale out uh, roll out vaccination, but it's got to really squash down uh, infection rates. Uh, and, and 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 they're two feed off each other, uh, you know. Uh, the vaccination needs needs suppression to succeed, uh, and suppression will will be helped when vaccination uh, roll, is rolled out. Yeah, um, I've got a question about. Um, I don't know whether this falls into your brief technically or not, but um, I'll let you have a go. <laughs> um, uh, um, what's happening with homeless people at, at the moment? Um, I think you know. It seems like there was some funding initially, but that's that. Uh, I think has petered out. That's from Penny um, Wilson. Well, I mean, it, 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 uh, they should. I mean, there should hopefully be um, on the health run. Uh, there should hopefully be a system in place. I mean, obviously, not everybody will. Um, sadly, people will fall through the cracks. That's just that's just a, a reflection of what happens when you run your public services on a, you know, on a, you know, strip them bare for years and years and years. But CCGs should have for, um, specialist uh, primary care procedures in place to ensure that homeless people have access to primary care. And that means in turn, they will get called up for vaccination. But obviously it's not going to be as effective as it should be everywhere because of the, because of years of austerity and funding squeeze and cutbacks in, in health provision, sadly. Um, uh, but again, <laughs> there is no health security in any of this uh, uh, unless we vaccinate all of us. You know, this is 
all of us have to move together on this. So we cannot be dividing society or, or anything like that. Uh, I mean, it, that offends us anyway as, as socialists, as Labour Party members or supporters. Uh, but it would be completely counterproductive when you're trying to build health security against COVID anyway. So everybody has to have access to the, vi to the, to the vaccine and healthcare. That is a, I mean, yeah, I believe it's a moral right for people to have access to healthcare anyway. But in this in, the, in this crisis, people have to have access to healthcare and the vaccine in order to protect us all. Yeah. Um, and a final question um, from uh, uh, Natalie Ashburner. Um, will Labour reward NHS staff when they next come to power after a decade of real terms pay cuts? Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, of course. Uh, there was also a question along similar lines about tuition fees for um, medical students. Um, yeah, we've got uh, to expand training places. We've got to bring back um, bursaries. Uh, 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 that was a big uh, uh, commitment that we made in the last few years. And we've got to stick to it because we've got a, we've got a staffing crisis. And one of the things that I mean, the other thing this pandemic has shown is that there was already a massive shortage of nurses globally. But the UK had relied on international treatment for years and years and years. Well, obviously, some of the Brexit issues throw that into doubt anyway now. But we cannot keep expecting to just sort of pluck nurses from across the world when we know health systems across the world uh, 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 need to be staffed as well. So uh, the thing we're going to have to do, quite rightly, is invest in training and recruiting staff here. And we've got to expand training places and make sure we've got more doctors and nurses uh, uh, than before. Uh, if, if this crisis has shown us anything, it's surely shown us the value of a well-resourced National Health Service and how protecting health is the foundation of everything else. Because as soon as your health is attacked, your economy comes to an end, it impacts on, uh, and it impacts on every aspect of your life. So investing in healthcare has got to be a big guiding principle as it will be I'm sure of the next Labour government. Thanks very much Jonathan. Um, I think with that we'll wrap up. Um, so um, thank you again to Jonathan for